We are all co-authors in the study and we will speak on behalf of all eight co-authors, some of whom were not able to be here today. My name is Shirsten sandstrom Orkabal. My name is Nermeen Abdelkader. My name is Christina Cole. And my name is Claire Wilkinson and all of us are currently English instructors at the University of Toronto. And my name is Angelica Galante. I'm an assistant professor at McGill University in Montreal. Our article will be of interest to those of you who would like to know more about the differences between teaching English using a plurilingual approach compared to an English-only approach. In many countries such as Canada and the US, students who register for English courses already speak other languages. What happens is that we have classrooms with students who speak multiple languages. So providing instruction that engages them on making connection among all of these languages can be helpful when learning English. So instead of using an English-only approach that has been traditional in TESOL, I designed a study in collaboration with seven teachers in which each one of them would teach two groups of students, but using different approaches. One group would be receiving plurilingual approach, and another group would be receiving an English-only approach. At the time of data collection, the teachers were not made aware of the differences between these two approaches so that their potential bias would not affect the results of the study. The plurilingual tasks we applied encourage our students to use their entire repertoire and not only their first language. For example, in our classes there were students drawing on Chinese and Korean to learn English but also comparing their languages with the languages of other students in class. These tasks were translanguaging, intercomprehension, and cross-linguistic and cross-cultural comparisons. All of these tasks can be seen on the website breakingtheinvisiblewall.com, and you can read more about them in our article. Two types of data collection were used, classroom observations and individual interviews with all seven teachers. The goal of the study was to investigate teachers' perceptions of plurilingual instruction compared to an English-only approach. It's important to note that teachers usually believe they have to speak multiple languages or that they have to speak the languages of their students to be able to implement plurilingual instruction. So we wanted to test if that was true. Not all of the teachers in our study spoke English as their first language. But all of us identified as a plurilingual person except for one teacher. So we were also interested in knowing if that teacher who identified as monolingual would be comfortable with plurilingual instruction. Here are the results. The first result was that all of the seven teachers unanimously reported preference for plurilingual instruction compared to monolingual instruction. Even the one teacher who self-identified as a monolingual speaker of English. The second result, plurilingual instruction, taps into students' lived experiences as the tasks engage them in genuine discussions about language and culture in relation to the topics of the class. The third, it challenges our own potential monolingual and monocultural mindset as the tasks reminded us that students may have more than one language only or more than one cultural orientation. The fourth is that plurilingual instruction advances the agentive power of role reversal. For example, students can be put into the teacher's role and teachers into the student's role. The fifth, it allows students to show pride in their flexible language use. Students shouldn't feel ashamed if they don't speak like a native speaker of English, and they should feel proud of all the languages they speak. The sixth, it engages students in learning, and our students were really eager to participate in class, probably because the activities tapped into their own experiences. And finally, the seventh affordance is that plurilingual instruction provides a safe space in the classroom and students are able to engage in discussions of the similarities and differences among languages and cultures in a non-judgmental way. One challenge that we found relates to the English-only policy in the classroom. Some teachers sometimes were afraid of allowing other languages in the classroom. But once they saw that their students were benefiting from the tasks uh, and from this type of instruction, 
their fear was removed. To conclude, these results suggest that teachers perceive plurilingual instruction as more beneficial than an English-only approach, and they don't have to be plurilingual to be able to apply this type of instruction. Based on these results, we make some important recommendations. One recommendation is that professional teaching certificates like TESOL, TESOL, and TEFL include courses in plurilingual instruction so that teachers can be better prepared to teach linguistically and culturally diverse students. And another recommendation is that this type of instruction should be seen as context specific and it may differ depending on the setting. For example, teaching English in Canada or EFL in Japan. The last recommendation is for teachers to try out this type of instruction and be ready to be surprised as it has a transformative power. We hope you have found this video abstract helpful and that you enjoy reading our article in TESOL Quarterly. Adios. Sayonara. Salut. Arrivederci. Ciao.